On this podcast, I've come back to meet my old media studies tutor, Neil Nixon. Right. Uh, Hello, Shane. You, you, yeah, you I, haven't changed a bit. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, you haven't, though. That's why I said when I <laughs> walked in, I said you still look as young as you did back then. Oh, thank you very much. It's, it, I, I was a lot fitter then, and if I look at photographs of myself, then the thing I notice is I'm, I was running... A, nearly a couple of thousand miles a year so I was a lot <laughs> thinner in those days which I wouldn't do now because I, I worked out I'm so slow these days that if I train for a marathon be like I'm in a full time job <laughs> with so many hours a week yeah but I think you was and I've said it you know, to you on the phone you was one of the most inf- influential people that I've met in my life that's actually had a massive effect on me and it's got me into you know, the conspiracy theories the uh, the paranormal the aliens the UFOs Okay. Um, I, I, so I, I can blame you for all that. You can. Well, I, the, the first question I'd ask you then is, was that a good thing? Yeah, I mean, it's something I've definitely enjoyed. Um, and also, I think one of the main things you taught me was never to trust the media. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, um, which, is, which is probably, if that was 30 years ago, is probably a little bit ahead of the game then. I mean, we were encouraged in those days to make people critical about it which looking at the way that fake news and social media have taken over these days is probably a, a useful skill um, if, if people are duped these days uh, a large number of people who probably fall into that would be people who learned to trust the media when they were older um, and aren't really savvy with you know more sort of social media and stuff like that now. I think uh, with the fake news and, and all that I mean you told me to always look for the quotes Right. Always look for the words. So if you look at a news article, yeah. see the headline, then look for the quotes. Okay. And to see how, what stories you can make up from those quotes. Would it right. match those headlines? Well, I tell you, I'm, I'm relieved to hear that because when you, when you said you were going to come and interview me and we were going to talk about the stuff that I got you into, like comedy and the paranormal, it struck me that the things that you're saying I got you into were the things I wasn't employed to teach you. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I don't recall that UFOs or uh, Viz Comic were part of anybody's syllabus in those no. days. No, <laughs> but they're, they're the things I'm not. You, you, talk, you talk me about content. Okay. Um, about uh, ideology, uh, about how the media is controlled and all that, which was like so important. Going through my life, oh, good. knowing where people were trying to control you or trying to make me think a certain way, and to be outside that box, not to be one of those people that just follows, right. but can actually think independently and see things differently to everyone else who's following the sheep. Yeah. And that, that is what you taught me to be. Oh, um, wow, okay. Well, that, 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 that was the general idea. I mean, such as I remember a 30-year-old syllabus, those were the... <laughs> well, no, but the, the critical awareness stuff on it, and yeah. I, I, as I recall it, words like ideology were actually somewhere in the learning outcomes that we were supposed to be teaching back yeah. in those days. So. Yeah. Uh, oh, good. I'm, I'm glad it went in. It, it, it did go. It, it, if we you had failed a cla- me on, you, didn't mar- you never gave me good marks for my coursework. <laughs> oh, all right. Sorry. No. <laughs> a- a- apologies in retrospect. I mean, look, for, for what it's worth, it's, um, uh, it's sometimes the case that the people who get the best coursework marks are not the ones that go on to the greatest successes yeah. later on. And um, where we're sitting now in the Miskin Radio Studios, there's about... 30 feet in that direction through a couple of walls is our wall of fame where we've got photographs of the ex-students. And it's interesting that, um, without naming any names, there's somebody on that wall of fame who probably earns as much as about three quarters of the rest of them put together. And that person hasn't got a degree, which is interesting, Mm. yeah? Just was very single-minded about where they went. There's other people on there who were doing things that we never particularly taught them to do, like media courses, and now they're teaching English as a foreign language in China, which is not about earning huge amounts of money. It's about who they are. So in certain cases, it's not necessarily about the marks or about the specifics of it. You know, it's... um, it's not what we're graded on Ofsted for, but if you bring something out in somebody, so apologies with the marks, but that might have been like it often is. Yeah. That, that's pedantic about literally how ideas are expressed. But I, I think that's me not sticking to the criteria that was being taught. Yeah, and, and going off with your enthusiasms. But if you yeah. then, if, if, <laughs> if a few years later you find yourself ghost hunting and you're <laughs> thinking, well, I can't imagine a place I'd rather be, yeah. then, you know, that's not a bad thing. I'd and I think it was that at the time, I used to, used to ask, well, the course asked for 
a breakdown of something. And I'd give you oh, six pages. And everyone else would give you like half a page. And they'd, they'd get A and I'd get a C. <laughs> and it's nothing, <laughs> I th there's too much in there. Possibly, that, yeah. It, uh, it, excuse me if I don't remember literally, but that sounds like what you see on a fairly regular basis, that sometimes there's, there's a lot of enthusiasm that manifests itself in gathering and hurling a load of content at the person yeah. that's teaching you. Um, I mean, you, you saw you me clearly finish got with lost somewhere. I clearly got lost somewhere. <laughs> uh, well, or you found other things. That's it's not necessarily a bad thing at all. I mean, we've you know, if, if you came through that with a qualification, then yeah, we achieved something. If you then went on to a an eclectic career that feels like your life, then fine. There's there, there's more emphasis these days on making people employable than there used to be. But the whole thing about the course you were on, which was a little bit ahead of its time then was about if i remember rightly the there was a buzzword on cpve which you wouldn't have known but they told us when we were learning to teach here which is that subjects were studied in clusters in other words there was a there was a kind of focus around certain common subjects and certain common problem solving skills yeah. and so in a way that was ahead of its time because these days there's much more emphasis on the vocational courses mm -hmm. on that it's about transferable skills. Well, I never used to turn up for media studies, um, <laughs> IT and photography, I think. <laughs> so. Well, we, we might be more kindred spirits than you than you think on that one. I, I think this guy's still alive. The last time I saw he was, and he, he, if he is, he's a, he's a World War II veteran, so he might actually be a bit fodder when he goes because he'll be one of the few, but um, there was a guy that taught me at school, and cut a very, very long story short, when I was about 26, I ran into him in Marks and Spencers in Carlisle, right? Um, and I told him what I was doing for a living. And he thought I was winding him up, mm. because similar to yourself then, it was, I wouldn't have distinguished myself in the sixth form as a naturally gifted student, yeah, yeah right? Um, and that's interesting, because I don't have an English A-level, although I studied it, but I tell the students this and it would be under current educational regulations it would be pretty much it would be expellable now yeah. but um, there was a little bit of a pub culture in my sixth form because we were in a little market town and everything and I do actually remember sitting and having a drink at one point with some people who were in the sixth form um, and we were thinking about how unjust it was that we had part-time jobs, a social life, and they expected us to complete A-levels. <laughs> and there was a discussion about the fact that any two good A-levels would get you to uni, which then morphed into a discussion about, right, which ones are we going to fail? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and I chose to fail English. Um, well, I didn't choose, it wasn't as blatant as that, but basically yeah. I, I made, I concentrated on the two I knew I could well, see. I, I had a media studies teacher that kept telling us to go to comedy clubs. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, but it, it but, but it, in, it, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but in, in yeah, some. Yeah, but it was, but that, that's the thing. I, you had that balance of, you knew what you had to teach us, but also you knew not to be stuck on a pedestal. Come down to the level that we were talking about, that ironically, you was writing the stuff that we was into. That we was into Viz. That was coincidental, yeah, by the way. Viz yeah, Viz and, and brain damage. And we found that, you, you see the magazine there one day, we was reading it, and you went, go to the credits. Oh, right, did I? And okay. your name was there. <laughs> and we was like, nah, nah. And yeah, it, it was you. And then to prove it, then you'd done a bit about our old media studies teacher, because we had two, we had you and, I can't remember if it was John or something like that. Oh, and, right. And that... you made, you've done a bit at Elvis working in a chip shop and living above a flat in a chip shop. And Would the name be John name. Meredith? Now, John Meredith, he was the CPV runner. He was. So he was that year. But no, he was, this was, he was quite a short guy with jet black hair. I have to um, go for your, the brain damage thing and try and find it, because his name's in there. Oh, is it? Okay. Right. Yeah. It might have been one of the ones that was only in for a short time. There were a couple of people who were with us for, as I recall it, less than one academic year. They only yeah. sort of did September round to June. So, well, actually, which under the old conditions of service would be a year, wouldn't it? But um, Yeah, because right. I think, I'm not sure if you left after, yeah, when I left, I think you might have moved on. I'm not sure if you stayed around that much longer. I left in, I've been 
I started in Dartford on the 1st of April 1991. So technically speaking, I left on the 31st of March 1991. I think you'd have been gone by then, wouldn't you? I left in 1990. Yeah. So, so I, I didn't do a full year after you left. I was yeah. there six months later. Yeah. 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 So that's about right, yeah. Yeah, okay. You'd had enough. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> we moved with my wife's job to Maidstone, so something south of the river was going to be a good idea. Yeah. yeah. I think something that you, you told me as well, they'd opened up a football museum in Lake District. And oh. I went up there to see it. Just coincidence, I went up there and went to the football museum in um, Tully House Ambleside. Oh, Ambleside. Yeah. And they had a mock-up of your, your club stadium in there. Oh, um, right. If, now, if I'm remembering that right, that was... Um, was it one of your friends or someone you knew? Yeah. I've long lost touch with the guy. I think it's Stuart Clark. He did an exhibition called That's The Homes it. of Football. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And he took photographs. So he's, he... I think it was Arts Council money. I can't remember now. But um, he was commissioned to take photographs of football grounds. So he's exhibition it was an ongoing traveling thing that it used to plop down in loads of places um and of course the photographs changed because he kept updating them mm. and um I, I met him a few times actually i had quite those it's pre-email days those but I, I had some dealings with him i wrote a couple of articles about it and i met him he had a he put the exhibition on in tully house in carlisle which was quite impressive because they actually gave a lot of it over uh, I didn't realise it had gone to Ambleside, but then yeah. ironically, the next time I saw the exhibition, it was in Maidstone, and what was ironic about that was they they booked it ages in advance, and they put the exhibition in Maidstone. It was when Maidstone United had got into the league, but they sold their ground, so they played their league games up in Dartford here, yeah, that's right? right? Yeah, So it was that, and then ironically again, which just what, what's the chances of this happening? In that exhibition, when it was in Maidstone, there was a picture of a Maidstone fan in the exhibition. But what was ironic about it was it was a Maidstone fan at an away game. So there, <laughs> there were no photographs of the, the, the stadium that had just been bulldozed and is now, um, <laughs> it's part of a, like a sort of big shopping centre. Yeah. Um, you know, like warehouse unit size, yeah? That's where the old site is. Um, there were no photographs of that old London road ground in there. Yeah. That's weird to say, I've, I've done... I've I remembered a lot. I remembered a lot. Of yeah, that, that, that is amazing, actually, <laughs> that you remember all that. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna Google that. I, I don't know. It's so long since I had any dealings with that. I don't know if the Homes of Football exhibition is still going. Yeah, it'd be interesting to go and see it. See where it's gone. Yeah. But as I say, you know, so moving on from there, I mean, I left, I left college, and I ended up working for Photo Labs and and all into that, and I got into. I had this interest in, in ghosts and paranormal and aliens and UFOs and, you know, from talking to you mm. and, and conspiracy theories. Um, how did you first get involved in, in the UFO stuff? How did you start? Well, that's an interesting question. I've been asked that loads of times. And if I'm honest, I can't remember. And so I'll, I'll give you two answers to this. <laughs> um, I think I was always curious and that just sort of satisfied my curiosity. And when I think about it now, that makes sense to me. So it just fired my imagination from as young as I can remember. And so therefore as young as I could imagine anything. Now that said, when I've been to the odd UFO conference and done presentations and stuff and, and people have come and talked to me afterwards and asked me that same question. Because if you do those conferences occasionally, yeah. People will come and you, 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 random people come and interview you about it, and a number of them <laughs> have said to me, "Well, if you can't remember a time before, it's because you were abducted," yeah. <laughs> which I don't believe for a second. But I've I've actually had that said to me, you know, like as in yeah. this would explain it because you know your brother's in the sky, and I don't think it's that. I just I don't remember a time before it, and um, it might be to do with how old I am and the fact that when I was younger and quite impressionable, there was a lot of, one thing that I was really interested in was the whole thing about space and the fact that, you know, we were flying into space and exploring it. Yeah. And there were discussions from when I was a kid about whether you would ever find life out there. I mean, there were, back in those days, there were people who would, you know, I'm old enough to remember the first moon landing, for mm. example, which I 
actually believe happened, by the way. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I seriously think we've been. Um, and I, I, I remember from you know being a very young, impressionable kid that when they said, well, they might find evidence that there was once life on the moon, that you know quite excited me. And just so it, it, I think it's that. I think it's mm. just always having been open to the possibilities. So do you think, I mean, nowadays, if you say you believe in UFOs, you, you're ridiculed. Now, but if I say I believe in life on other planets, mm -hmm. people go, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Because when you think there's, what, 13 billion un um, universities or uh, galaxies in, in our own system. That we know about. That we know about. And that, that's assuming that this is the only dimension that there is. Exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, now the possibility of life, it's got to be there somewhere. Yeah, and, and, and I, I mean... I'm more interested in those books and those websites now that talk about that because there's there, there are some fairly central questions to it. I mean, if if you think about from being impressionable to the fact that I'm still fascinated by that, I could sum it up in a few arguments. That first of all, one of the reasons I've stayed fascinated in it and not ever got tired of it is because I've seen a lot of progress in our understanding in that time, but it's not the progress that you'd think. Um, the history of ufology, while I've been involved in it and been interested in it, is also the history of great cases that we're going to prove to all the sceptics. And every yeah. single one of them crashed and burned, in, as far as I can yeah. see anyway. Um, but alongside that, probably about the time I was teaching you, when I got involved in various things, it just occurred to me, the closer you got to the people that were involved in it, the more they were interesting to learn about. Not yeah. a, I'm not being patronising about this, because, I mean, obviously it, it would be raving hypocrisy to say, well, you know, because <laughs> I'm one of them, right? Yeah. But you, you, you see the different tribes that are in there. So there's, there are people who come and go very quickly because they have absolute amazed reactions to stories they hear. And then they realise that some of these stories aren't quite what they thought they were, so they, they get tired of it quite quickly. And there's a, those of us who've stuck it out for a long time have often got more sceptical, but we've also got quite passionate about the things that we think we know. And we think, uh, yeah, I think yeah. that's sort of like half the problem, though, because you've got people there that may have genuine, what they believe is a genuine vision or experience, but then you've got people there that clearly haven't, but know that these people will buy their stories to make money out of it. And that mm -hmm. muddies the water. So you say yeah, working I think so. things out. Oh, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, it depends on you know on the individual stories, and we could swap UFO cases all the time. But for example, uh, one of the best known of all of them, the Cash Landrum case, from yeah. which coincidentally happened the day after the Rendlesham Forest incident. Mm. If you believe most of the stories about the Rendlesham Forest incident and yeah. the day, um, it's it's a cracking story, but the sceptical view of it, the Skeptoid podcast, which covered it, in fact, I was listening to it driving home last night, it's that recent, the Skeptoid yeah. take on it, he points a few things out, which is that a lot of the physical effects of the UFO involvement may be explained by something prosaic like the fact that Betty Cash had alopecia, so her hair fell out for that reason yeah. and not for radiation. And in any case, according to one scientific take on it, if they'd had the radiation dose that would have caused those effects that they're claiming right away, it would have been a fatal dose, so they wouldn't have lived yeah. long enough. And they did then go on and try and sue the American government for, well, it was <laughs> it was a multi-million dollar, just I think it was two million, but it was... So does that mean that she, that you was coming in for the money? <laughs> well, the sceptical view of it would be that. I mean, I've not, not got close, to them, close enough to them to know. Uh, I, I never went to one of the conferences that they attended. Yeah. Um, that said... I'm quite interested in that case because there's virtually no way you can explain it other mm. than to say that there was some incident, some actual cause of the the first incident. I mean, the, there are one or two. Um, the Fire in the Sky movie, which is based on yeah, the Travis... Yeah. Okay, yeah. right. So it's based on the Travis Walton abduction. And it's a case that's told to this day and Travis Walton still turns up on those kind of, you know... And I mean, they all pass the, the lie detector test. Ah, oh, go on. Tell me about that. Right. But how reliable are lie detector tests? They didn't all pass the lie detector test. They did eventually. Oh, right. Well, okay. I didn't if know if that. you read um, UFOs, the public deceived by Philip Class, it's interesting. The reason that 
according to him, and I've no reason to distrust this, the reason that the National Enquirer didn't pay out the $100,000 yeah. is because before the group en masse took a lie detector test, uh, Travis Walton took one and failed it. And yeah, oh, and right. okay. Philip Plass discovers, discusses rather Travis Walton's history as a convicted criminal prior to that and suggests that... Yeah, they, I only found that out, um, I think a couple of years ago, that mm -hmm. he was a convicted criminal, mm -hmm. which did then question, question more what's going on there. I mean, I'm, I'm quite sceptical about the story anyway, mm. but on the face of it, it, it all sounded very, very genuine. And that they did, passed yeah. the lie detector test. Mm. And I said, I wasn't aware that he failed one. Now, um, if I understand it correctly on that one, there was going to be a mass, a massive payout. And that first failed lie detector test was the reason that it didn't happen. Mm. Um, and that, again, this is, I've been to conferences where Travis Walton's actually spoken. And to this day, he turns up. I'm, I know, uh, did you see Sean Ryder on UFO? Yes. Ah. Oh. If ever anybody was born to do that, he's got to go. He's got to do more. It's yeah, fantastic. seriously. I would if anyone don't know the the phone and sky story, it was a group of loggers, were they yeah. loggers, coming back from working in Arizona. They yeah, see yeah. the light come down. He went out. He got out of the truck and said he got abducted. Then he yeah. woke up weeks five later, days, five yeah, days yeah, later, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they found him back in the town. Yeah. But apparently, he could only remember what would be hours. Yeah. yeah. So it was and. The other witnesses to it were the rest of the logging crew that were in a pickup truck. So mm. um, he was the only person to get out of the pickup truck. So I mean, it's interesting. If if you were going to look at it skeptically, probably the longest skeptical argument against it is in that book. I've quoted a couple of times. Philip Classy's UFO: The mm. Public Deceived. He didn't believe it for a second, and he actually got into a spat with the people who believed the story. Um, which is all recorded in the book, and he discusses in that how they were almost going to go head to head on a third polygraph examination. Yeah, um, and you know the, the UFO, the number of UFO investigation investigative organisations that were interested in it. As I recall, it, it was an American organisation called APRO, Aerial Phenomena Research Organisation, and Coral and Jim Lorenzen, who were the two that yes. ran it, who yeah. were most vehement about yeah. that. Um, and they were well aware of the polygraph and they explained the failed polygraph to do with the state he was in when it happened. But there's an argument in that book about the reputation of the first polygraph examiner versus the reputation of the second right. one, suggesting basically that they got the guy that might pass them on the second <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah? And the whole, the whole thing came to a grinding halt because Philip Klass and APRO were prepared or were preparing to go head to head with the third examination polygraph examination and they couldn't agree the terms finally um and uh but do you yeah. think like to find the truth you've got to look at before the event so were they interested in ufos before uh, did they Probably. know travis walt and andy's brother yeah. yeah so that that's what i did find out that they yeah. were interested they were deep into it and i think that often tells you a lot about these people that do see, see UFOs. It might tell you some about that, yeah. I mean, it, certainly in, in, in the years I've been or involved... abductions, at least. Yeah. Now, that said, um, I've met abductees, and I would be the last person with some of the people that I've met to say that they're liars, and the last person to say that I know what happened to them, right? I mean, I've got certain ideas about it, and the psychological explanations strike me as plausible in some cases the the hypnagogic states of you know when you're not asleep but you're not awake but mm. more asleep than awake and I mean over the years I've come to really value some of the cases that get marginalized in the mainstream abduction accounts and everything because often because they're actually seen as so surreal that nobody trusts them but there's a few in there I think are actually quite insightful that if, if we took them more seriously there's a case of a woman called Maureen Puddy in Australia in 1973 off the top of my head she saw an alien walk around a car while she was meeting two UFO investigators and the UFO investigators saw nothing and yet she's quite a sincere witness mm. that would suggest that maybe what's going on is in her head Right. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the mince pie Martians case. No, oh, no, no. That's no. worth a look. That oh, is I've well worth a look. 
uh, Rowley Regis, which is in the Midlands, and I think it's around 19, late 1979, early 1980. It's over Christmas anyway, which is what's called the Mince Pie Martians. And um, off the top of my head, I think the woman who saw it was a woman called Jean Hingley. And again, it tends to be marginalised by the UFO literature because it's a bit surreal to say the least. There was some event in her back garden which was covered in snow and there was some physical trace left of an area of snow that had melted. She described meeting aliens that sort of floated into her house and the best sketches make them look like Casper the ghost. Fine. And because it was Christmas, she was at home alone, it was over the 12 days of Christmas, but after Christmas, she offered them mince pies, right? <laughs> and yeah, I know. Which again is a little bit surreal and you wonder what was actually going on. It's almost like there was some electrical event that triggered it and caused some altered state of consciousness. There was a guy called Albert Budden who wrote three books on effectively electromagnetic pollution and other effects and how they might bring about UFO experiences in people. Uh, and another of my all-time favourites is a um, case of a guy called Alfred Bertou in... 1983, was fishing on a canal bank in the middle of the night in Aldershot. Some people think this was a wind-up, but his wife said he was actually quite sincere and he wasn't much given to practical joking. And he apparently saw a UFO land while he was fishing and he just walked up quite calmly to investigate it. He was on his own, there was nobody else around. And he walked into it, at which point he was told that he was too old and infirm for their purposes and he went back fishing and they took off. <laughs> yeah, well, again, I, I wonder, if, if you and I had been stood on that canal bank, I think we might have seen an 83-year-old guy asleep while he was fishing. Yeah. I mean, I think what you're saying, it actually backs up a lot of the stuff we found when we were doing the paranormal investigation stuff, that we used to use the EMF meters to go around, not to check for ghosts, but to check the electromagnetic field in, in buildings that we're in. And so at the, the Berlin in Horndon, we found that a lot of people would have visions of people standing at the end of the bed. Um, but when we checked the bed, it was a wrought iron bed, and the, the head part behind it was a great big electrical cabinet. Oh, so the right. EMF was banging on, I mean, it was going off the, off the scale. So when someone's sleeping there, those limbs, <laughs> that, those, her brain must have been charged with everything. Yeah. And they'd, people would say they'd wake up in the middle of the night and have visions of people standing, standing at the end of the bed. Well, with that level of EMF going through the brain, that can stimulate everything. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that a lot of people that see ghosts at the end of the bed, they've probably got electric blankets, they've probably got, you know, nowadays, mobile phones next to their bed. And I do think if you walk into an environment where EMF is so highly present, now a lot of people will get really bad migraines from it. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me, when it comes up to a thunderstorm, I get flashing lights and oh, like, right. migraines sort of thing. Um, so I think EMF has a lot to play in those sort of visions that you can have. Um, but when you get you talk about like, the fire in the sky and was the like, the spaceship sightings like uh, the, was it the one in Tehran, yeah. in 1975 when the they sent up the the jets to follow it. 76, yeah, I think it was. was yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, and they, the government said, oh, it was a jumbo jet, it was a, a public airliner. But yet it, that was qualified Yes, it was. It, it's, that, that's, it's an interesting one because obviously even sceptical ufologists would often have a case where they think it's very difficult to explain it. And for me, that would be, that would be one. Um, Yes, it, it's complicated that one. So, but because all their weapons are packed up, yeah, in it and everything. Yeah. So, the, so the the, the, the pro UFO lobby says more or less that there was report of an unidentified flying object. Two fighter jets were scrambled. This is in the middle of the night. It's in just past midnight, um, and they engaged it. But at the point at which they armed the weapon systems, the electrical circuits on the plane went down, mm -hmm. and both of them were then forced to come back to base. Um, and there's other bits and pieces going on, like an object that detached from a big UFO and appeared to land in the desert. Um, and so it, it's a very complicated case with enough people involved that you, would, you, you can't claim it as just one person's misidentification yeah. of something. Um, the sceptical view of it, and again, actually, funny enough, I've mentioned before, but <laughs> Philip Kloss, who's the arch-sceptic, is probably the best source on the sceptical view of it because his job 
his day job was that he was an aviation journalist, so he mm. was his his professional business was to understand planes and weapon systems and stuff like that. Um, he puts it down to one or two things that the pro UF the, the pro alien lobby tend to ignore, which is that first of all that they weren't particularly used to night flying in Tehran in 1976, and yeah. that the I think the way he described it was something like it was um, a boys' flying club or something. <laughs> the Iranian Air Force, in other words, effectively, it was the sons of the very rich that got to be yeah, fighter so it wasn't pilots. very skilled. Yeah, exactly, and certainly wasn't very skilled at intercepting unknown targets in the early hours of the morning. And then he, you know, there's there's other bits and pieces like meteors, possibly the meteor shower that was going yeah. on at the time, and everything like that. It's I'm still interested in that case because of all the of all the ones you'll find in the standard places. And I mean, I would, if if anybody's watching your video and wants to go and get an impartial thing, somewhere like the Wikipedia is as good yeah. as any, because their their standards mimic, albeit in a very down market kind of way, peer reviewed stuff. So it's interesting. The Wikipedia openly says the last time I read it with regard to Roswell that there's no evidence of a UFO landing. Yeah. Right. Okay. It, explores the Tehran incident with some equal balance on it. Yeah. If you're going to debunk it, you need a lot of linked arguments to debunk it, right? Mm -hmm. And if you were going to look at that as, and I'm not sure, I, I do believe that it's a bona fide alien thing, but if you're going to look at that as a, as a bona fide alien thing, you could almost say, well, that's what we would expect because if some random alien probe just happened to stumble into our atmosphere, we might encounter it in an unexpected way like that. Yeah, mm. and I mean, if, if you know, if, if I've got an all-time favourite possible alien contact case, it's the one that a lot of hard-headed sceptics would go for, which is the the so-called Wow signal from yeah. 1977, yeah. right? And the Wow signal is a good case, a because conventional science still struggles to explain it, yeah. albeit there are. There are arguments that it's just about scientifically possible that it could be an earthbound signal that reflected off some space hardware briefly, yeah. and therefore that was such a random event it won't repeat itself. Um, but alternatively, you might say, well, it's exactly what we'd expect, some random signal from some probe that's just staggering through mm. the, the, the cosmos, and we can't find it in the same place because it's a probe and it's moving. Yeah. Then, I mean, the other argument was that it was a, uh, a star exploding. Yeah. Or and a, again, a big we, meteorite exploding yeah, yeah. and it calls that signal. Yeah, yeah. Um, I well, mean, yeah, I'm fascinated by the well, well signal. Well, me, me too. And because all the arguments are equally plausible. I'm just going to explain. The well signal is a signal that's picked up by, I can't remember the, the station now. I can't off the top of my head either. But uh, in 1977, and it's, it, it's effectively a... It's a signal that appears to have, it, it comes in on the right wave band, it appears to have some intelligence possibly behind yeah. it. So it would either be something we could, like you say, like an exploding star, or it, it's got the same structure as a signal that we could broadcast from Earth and would reflect accidentally. Yeah, it's called WOW because that's what they wrote next yeah, to it yeah. to highlight yeah, the, 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 the Yeah, exactly. The, 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 the person actually picking it up on the radio telescope for the first time because he couldn't understand it did that. and. Yeah, the, the the beauty of that is it's it's there's no one explanation that is so clearly stronger than the others that you might as well allow yeah. in the fact that it might just have been an intelligent message. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, I find it fascinating that that if you're going to use a piece of evidence to say there's life out there, that's one that you can use because yeah. there's no credible evidence to deny that it didn't happen. No, it, no, it and, happened. Yeah. Um, they've checked out all the what was going on in the buildings and other stations and yeah would it ever be repeated i don't know how long were they looking for skies i think it was what 10 years before yeah, they something found like that. that again off, off the top matter can't and they've been scanning it for like another 40 50 years yeah, after yeah. and it's not happened again now although our ability to scan is getting better the 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 the, the hardware and software that runs it is getting better and better isn't it so you think yeah. we're now in a position where we can detect earth-like planets i mean i've over the years, whilst I've got a sceptical, I do see some quite hard-headed, plausible arguments that are still very receptive about mm. them being alien life. So, the, the whole Fermi paradox, basically, you know, the, 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 the simple. Going down a rabbit hole now. <laughs> All right, but but, but it, 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 a 
question, I suppose, a reputable mathematician in the 1950s. If, if there's so much life out there, where are they, right? Yeah. And potentially all these planets that can support life. There's no evidence that civilizations would necessarily last a long time. In fact, at the moment, the worries about global warming, we appear to be in a position where we're quite capable of destroying the environment that we depend on. And there are quite a lot of different variables in this, including one that's you know, recently been discussed on, li literally this week I heard them discussing it on BBC Radio 4, so this is reputable, <laughs> that we're going to generate so much more carbon dioxide, we're actually going to make ourselves more stupid. Simple as that. Pe yeah. Human brains will function less efficiently if the, if the atmosphere is more rich in carbon dioxide. Um, consequently, that might be the seeds of our own destruction. And if most civilizations... Is that why Trump got elected? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you, you wouldn't... I mean, the, the, the smartest minds in a few years' time might... I, I seriously think the smartest minds in a few years' time will, will look back at climate change deniers now and think, what the hell were they thinking? Yeah. I mean, possibly in the same way that now, a hundred years later, we're looking back on World War I and you, you're watching a, a war on an industrial scale and thinking, how the hell were those tactics ever going to win quickly, yeah? yeah? You know, th th they were the tactics of the 19th century, but taken into a world of industrial scale killing, you know? So, uh, yeah, we may well look at, um, at climate change and the deniers now and think of them the way we think of the generals mm. in World War I, yeah? Renishan Forest. Yeah. It's <coughs> probably Britain's most famous UFO sighting mm -hmm. that happened to be American seeing it. Yeah. Now I'm quite skeptical about the whole the whole case. Right. I so know some I. really true believers of it. Right. That met the guys that said it's a hundred percent kosher case. W w which of the guys? Because again, the R Rendlesham like Roswell, it's fine until the, one of the places they both fall apart is that. These witnesses are very clear about all the things they saw in a lot of detail, but ironically, yeah. they didn't spot each other. No, and that's that's what I was coming to. So this is yeah. where it all breaks down to me. Right. That they all got these, as you say, they've all got their own ideas of it, which all tend to back up mm -hmm. each other, but they were never together. No. So Larry Warren goes on TV years later after right and left at Eastgate, runs into the field and says it came down here, yeah? You walk the UFO trail in Rendlesham Forest, which is there for oh, the tourists. Oh, that's where they've got now. the UFO there, haven't they? They've got a model of it there now. Yeah, and, and, but you can actually walk in the forest. You can walk... Have you done this? No, no. I, I would recommend you do it, Shane. Um, because you can... There's a car park, and there wasn't a model of a UFO that day, although I've seen a photograph of it on, like, a leaflet and stuff to do with it. But you can walk through the forest you walk from a car park so effectively you walk around to the east gate and then you do it but the place that they've cut out as a circular landing site is clearly within the forest so these things disagree with each other because yeah, it was in the u.s uh, the military base wasn't it uh, the the, mm. the ground of the military base well ground zero for where the ufo might have come down and of course there's dispute about whether it did because there's one one group of witnesses claimed that the thing manoeuvred through the trees. Yeah. Another group of witnesses claimed that there was a near enough a landing in a field. Yeah. Mm. Um, and the various written accounts disagree with each other. Um, but in, in terms of how it stacks up to me, I'm by no means convinced that there's a, you know, alien involvement in this. I mean, again, there's discussion about which day it happened. Yeah. Consecutive days are one day, and different accounts Yeah, because the that. data logs don't back that up neither, does it? No, no. So when you go into the actual written testimony, and what they what days they're on their shift, what days they're out on, on the duty, yeah. they didn't match up to what they said. Indeed, and, and the, the, the most commonly held sceptical theory, which, um, again, the Skeptide podcast did this quite recently, because I heard it not long ago. Um, I think it's them. They play the whole tape the apparent tape that was recorded live yeah yes and they overlay it with reminding the listener how often the lighthouse at Orford Ness flashes right um if i'm honest this one you can't prove but i, I have a 
I'm with a bunch of other people on this, albeit it's not the most common explanation that's put forward. You will find Isaac Coy's website has a huge bundle of Rendlesham documents not long downloaded onto the site. If you go and walk the UFO trail in the forest, which is now cut out, so this is more or less by common consent, the yeah. route that the airmen took on the night. Okay, so first off, First off, this is um, middle of the night, middle of the Christmas holidays. So if you were going to test any military hardware, that would be a good time to be doing it. Yeah. Because your chances of some random person in the forest just seeing you are as little as yeah. they'll ever be. Um, if you look at the trail, it comes left out of the east gate and then takes a route through the forest to the edge of the forest, but doesn't actually leave it. And the alleged landing site is cut within mm. sight of the edge of the forest. But... Is definitely within the forest. Um, just a hunch that whilst a bunch of a handful of unlucky people had been put on duty that night, the the vast majority of the people on the base were by common consent having a Christmas party. So it may well have been that whatever was going on was actually out of need to know of the people partying. If if some military equipment had been tested and I mean, you don't, this is supposition here, but it's not long before the mobile launch cruise missiles were brought to this country and they were very controversial and the camps, the, the military camps that had them were blockaded by mainly women in yeah. these camps, right? And these were American weapons on British soil, but they were based in American bases, which technically speaking were American territory. And UFO but, sightings went up during that time. Yeah, absolutely. But it, had they had some precursor of that at Rendlesham Forest, mm. the, the, the time to have dri driven it out of the base would have been in the middle of the Christmas holidays in the middle of the night. And it might, what might actually, when you get it back to what is undeniably evidence, right? So locals report strange lights in the forest to the police. The police come out and investigate it, find nothing except a bunch of people in the forest who were, you know, American air personnel who were on British territory, but, you know, apparently, are, you know, are, are within, almost within sight of their base. The Holt memo is for real, but it's interesting because there's always been an explanation. There's always been an acceptance that military personnel reporting UFO sightings were not doing their careers any good. Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt hasn't done too badly for the rest of his life, well, has he? That's it? true, but at the time he didn't know he was going to do well. That's what makes it... Uh, possibly, but... Um... I mean, let's face it, up to that point, no one had done really well when they were reported a UFO site. Okay, look, this is supposition, but what if Lieutenant Ch Colonel Charles Holt did well because actually he did his job well, yeah? True. There, there are, in other words, th there's, there is undeniably a track record of particularly the American military, using UFO stories as a means of covering something else yeah. up. And I'm not saying that every single conspiracy theory then is believable, but there was one that was declassified in the early 90s, which again isn't particularly talked about. I read this in, I can't remember the name of the UFO magazine, but it was Martin Kottmeyer, who, who's quite a reputable, you know, sceptically minded person who, who wrote it. Um, and he wrote a story about... An, in, in 1956, a bunch of American servicemen were uh, put on detail to protect a cargo. So they had quite an unusual assignment because they travelled all the way from Budapest to Fort Knox and they stayed within sight of this cargo and they were the guard of it. And they were told that what they were guarding were the wings and engine of a flying saucer. Now this isn't particularly publicised in the UFO community because, A, because we now know what was in the cargo and it was nothing to do with the UFO. Secondly, because this whole wings and engine of a flying saucer doesn't fit the kind of models that we've got, right? Yeah. But it might well be a plausible story to somebody in 1956. But what they were actually carrying were the Hungarian crown jewels. Huh. And the story was declassified post-Glasnost because there was no need for secrecy anymore because when Hungary became an independent country yeah. again, the crown jewels were repatriated. But they knew that the Russians were coming and the whole point of this was to protect a Hungarian national treasure and the Americans were capable of shifting it from there. And as I recall it, they went, it went by train, by sea, by train, and then I think by truck to Fort Knox. And po well, I might be wrong about the truck at the end of it, but, <laughs> but the, the, the whole thing is that the, a, a team of servicemen were put 
on the entire detail, which would be an unusual mission because if you were stationed in Europe, you wouldn't expect that they would then say to you, right, you lot stay together. Yeah. You know, you work in shifts and you don't stop until you get to Fort Knox. Yeah. And again, Fort Knox is not an obvious place to hide a UFO, but it's a very secure place to hide a lot of other things. Yeah. And it's interesting that that story predates a lot of the stories that come out about, you know, UFOs stashed in secret bases. Um, a lot of which claim to be stories from the past, but actually they only, like, like Roswell, people forget this about Roswell, that whilst it's taken as the greatest UFO case, and it happened in 1947, actually, if you look at the UFO literature from the mid-50s, from, well, from the, the first best-selling books to the end of the 70s, you don't see a lot of Roswell in there, despite that press release yeah. about the flying sa saucer, yeah? It comes down to Roswell really takes off when the National Enquirer pick it up in 1978 and then the Roswell incident book a couple mm. of years later. Um, at which point all these people are saying, yeah, well, you know, we were, we were mm. guarding the cargo and it's, it, you know, and loads of these crash retrieval stories come out yeah. after that. So one of the things I, I, I truly believe is that the same as the paranormal stuff. Now, every time I think, why does ghost stories come about? And if someone tells me about a, a ghost story that's been there since the 1800s, and I go back, I look at that town, look at the village, but I also look at what plays were on at that time. All right, yeah. And so like when Macbeth come out and, and all these sort of ones, you'd get more people would start reporting things like ghosts and, and all this, mm -hmm. because obviously they're, they start thinking about that. Or they get creeped out by things and they say, oh my God, I'll see something. Um, Back then, obviously, there wasn't no movies, there was no cinema. So, just sitting around telling stories. So, you used to get local people, people in the community would have visiting showmen that come there and tell them these ghost stories. That would then make people more likely to see something that wasn't really there, or something would fall over and they start saying it's a ghost. And so, old Jack the Fisherman's come back, or something like that. Yeah. That gets written down, and then more people say they've seen it or believe they've seen it. And I think that can happen with the, uh, the UFO stuff. And it's interesting, every time we've got, like after Independence Day, another spike in yeah. UFO. Mm. Every time something is reported, we get a spike in, in something. Well, yeah, and, and also to do with what people literally report. So the grey aliens that are ubiquitous now, there are two big spikes in what brings about lots of grey sightings. First of all, post-close encounters of the third yeah. kind, right, the movie. And before that, again, if you look at the literature, people in the 60s and early 70s are reporting a range of alien types, including, I miss the Nordics, right? <laughs> the, 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 the tall, humanoid, highly intelligent, yeah. hippie aliens. You know, they were great, but you know, they're, they're not hanging around these days. They're, they're certainly, you know, <laughs> The Nordics wouldn't have been the types that were going to sort of inseminate babies and breed a alien master race. And then um, another watershed. Okay, it's, it's hard literally to prove it, but Whiteley Stryber's book Communion, when that came out, which would be about when I was just before when I was teaching you, um, it had an amazing publicity campaign because what you saw on things like bus shelters and you know just other billboards were the front cover and a phone number, right? Mm. I.e. there's a face of an alien and a phone number, and obviously you rang up the phone number and you discovered that there was a, a book coming out by, because he's you know, a best-selling author of play. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, but what was amazing about that, first of all, was that that publicity campaign really worked because the face kind of resonated with people, but post-communion, that particular book cover, because it was a huge seller, but the, the cover and the poster were widely seen, including my people who had absolutely no mm. interest in it. And it's interesting, there's, there's been a kind of homogenization of the kind of aliens that were seen. Because prior to that, you know, some of the 1950s cases and before that, they're just gloriously surreal. I, I cannot remember the case or the play or anything like that, but I know, you know, I, when I used to do the presentations in conferences, I was always databasing this stuff when I was reading books. I was like, and I know there was somebody decades before that who was abducted aboard a ufo and claimed to see stone walls in it 
doesn't happen these days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, we've got, you know, we, we, we have a much clearer idea, apparently, of what we, we should expect. And, yeah. th and therefore, like with your ghost things, people just see it, you know. Um, and there are a lot of cases where the debunking of something would say, well, what people see and what they might perceive explains the case, right? Mm. So like, it, I cannot remember the name of the scientist, the, the guy that was I was talking to you about before we were filming this about the scientific theory that says basically a lot of ghosts are condensing water vapor in cooling buildings while sound waves that have been busy through the day because the buildings have been full are gradually bouncing between the walls and slowing down. Yeah. But that explains grey mists, and a lot of ghost stories start with, sh you know, grey figures that are spectral that yeah. you can see through them, often in long corridors, right? And so you could plausibly say, well, actually, and they're the ones that tend to get picked up on CCTV. Yes, of these course. grey yeah. mists things. Yes, and well, exactly, because they'd be there. I mean, there's, mm. there's no question then that that they were produced in a laboratory, and I, Lord knows what it is, but. There are one or two UFO cases. I mean, Project Hestel and ufologists are pretty much unique in ufology, that they were the only ones who would go to their research work expecting to see UFOs, and they did, mm. right? And there's no question about whether they were seeing aliens, but they, they were seeing, like, you know, some electrical event in the atmosphere in this valley in Norway. Which might be, you know, might have been was behaving sometimes like ball lightning and other times like a plasma. And I'm not enough of a scientist to tell you what the difference is between the two of them exactly. Northern um, lights, isn't it? Hmm? Northern lights. Well, that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I, remember, I, I met one of those guys. Uh, Odd Gunnar Road, his name was, and I met him at a conference. And I mean, now this is dedication, isn't it? They were working in a caravan which had some power supply, but they'd got a little radar and they could also they could film things and photograph things but they only had so much power in the place. So to turn the radar on, they had to turn the heating off. And this is Norway in the <laughs> middle of winter. And I remember saying to him, he was, he was just telling me before he did his presentation at um, this conference, he was just telling me about the whole thing and whatever. And I sort of said to him, it must have been cold then. And he just looked at me like, oh, don't ask. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's dedication. They're freezing but, but they were, yeah. I mean, basically, if I remember the story correctly, he'd got like his the gear that he used to use for skiing and everything and he'd got his you know his thermals and everything on and even then they're sitting there thinking this is really cold you know as in literally can we not turn the radar off and yeah. warm up for half an hour you know yeah. i mean I, I don't think there's no there's no puzzle why a lot of the strange ufo stuff is happening in russia and and all that because you know there's lack of information coming out there mm -hmm. and people couldn't just go and find it the areas are so vast um but when we look at like the meteorite strike mm -hmm. in Russia, you have, if you can go back 100 years and you see that. Oh, the Tunguska one you mean? Yeah. yeah. You'd swear that that was like, a UFO burning up in the atmosphere or crash landing or... You wouldn't understand it, yeah. No. And, and, and I mean, if you go back, you know, centuries, um, people are reading f fortunes, people are reading signs from God into those events, aren't Because there's one in Bristol. Um, and it there's appears in a painting as well. We've got a UFO oh, in the yeah. background, um, and that was meant to be witnessed by like the whole city. Mm. Which again, it, but could that have been something like a meteorite, or could it be a, a comet? Mm -hmm. You know, these yeah. sort of things you don't know. And I guess you know, if you go back centuries, and you have um, was it Halbop? Oh yeah. Can you imagine how people would have thought of that? Yeah. And have seen this thing through the sky. And well, it, it took. <sighs> It took a long time for people to understand some of the, such as I understand it anyway, so, you know, the, some things about the movement of comets. And we've got that Omamo, that asteroid that's passed through the solar system recently yes. that's tumbling. That's um, when they're saying it could be a spaceship or something. Yeah, and I heard a quite serious minded scientist discussing that not too long ago. And, it, and his argument actually goes back to an argument you'll find in some of the books that claim that the moon's artificial, that we shouldn't think about building spaceships in the way that we think about building uh, moon rockets if we, if we mm. were going to explore larger areas. It would make sense to build them out of the same components that, uh, that 
are used for asteroids, basically, the, the, yeah. the form asteroids, because they're quite resilient when they travel through the, the atmosphere, the, the solar system or through, through, the, through the galaxy. And the one that's moving through our solar system, I mean, the best evidence seems to be that it's just happened upon us and it's, mm. it's behaving as it would do. It's tumbling and it's, you know, you can look at it and say, well, it, it's made out of the same material that we see in asteroids. It looks like an asteroid. Yeah. It's behaving as if it's got quite a lot of metal in its structure, but then that's normal with asteroids and stuff anyway. Um, but no, I've, I've heard people say, if you were going to build a probe that was just going to explore the galaxy, right? Um, I'm not sure about that one, but it... It would make sense. It would, yeah. I mean, when you think of our probes that we've seen out there, they're all like spiny and <laughs> very fragile. Yeah. Well, they're designed to do the job that we want them to do and to relay the information that we want. And we've not seriously thought about designing mm. something that was... Well, ironically, what, yesterday Voyager 2 passed out of our solar system. Mm. And, you know, getting data back from that, I think we've still got some working instruments on there. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's going to be interesting to see what that comes back to. It is. But, it, of course, that was designed to teach us about our own solar system and past our own yeah. planets, right? So anything beyond here is a bonus, isn't mm. it? But the you're right, the instruments and the communication equipment is decades old by our standards. Probably will be incomprehensible to anybody who finds it. Yeah. It's pretty old school now because there, there's more computer technology in my watch, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's not particularly expensive either. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's not designed for that. I, I don't struggle with the idea that something that looks like an asteroid might be the best design if we were actually going yeah. to build craft to okay. explore. Okay, one of the, the big questions, yeah. have you ever seen a UFO? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so have I. Right. But I will say it was a UFO, an unidentified flying object. I'm not saying it's the aliens. Yeah. Um, and I was just sitting outside uh, my old house with my neighbour in the summer, looking up at the sky, and we just see this ship fly over the top. Right. And we both went in, looking up, we're seeing ghosts, and our girlfriends were there, and they went, you, you okay? And we was just like, we are just seeing a UFO. And we both run off and drew what we thought we'd see, and it both matched. Mm -hmm. um, the internet was a bad thing, so I went onto the Sky at Night website mm -hmm. and logged it on there. Did anyone see this? And there's reports from Glasgow right the way down to uh, Dover of this thing that had gone over. And, and obviously, the space stations out in that is completely the wrong direction, but it was quite low. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to judge how high or low it was, but it was dead silent and it just come over and just carried on going. And I remember like, we just looked at each other and we didn't talk. And yeah, it, and to tell people, yeah, I've seen the UFO, you mm -hmm. think, oh my God, now they're gonna think I'm crazy. But I, I look at it that the military mm -hmm. are doing so many developments. Yeah, I was, that, that's what that, I would be suspicious of in a case like that, actually, yeah. yeah. It's that you, you don't know. And I was waiting for like years later for a new prototype plane coming out or something like that, but nothing did. Nothing really moved on that we know about. Right. How do you, yeah, if, if you can't estimate the height and the distance, you don't know how big it is, so it might be way smaller than a plane. It was bigger. Oh. I'd say, as it came over, because I could judge it from the house, Right. it was a lot wider than, oh, say, okay. three, four houses, but it was totally silent. And, you know, yeah, it was seen all over. And I've been looking up on the internet um, uh, last night to try and see if I could find any reports because... So how long ago was that? That was in about nine, uh, 2003. Okay. 2002, 2003. And so, you know, and it's got to be reports of it somewhere. And I think it was in August as well. Right. Um, but I'm trying to find it again because I knew I was going to come, I was going to show you some oh, evidence okay. of it. But again, I'm, I'm that sort of person that, okay, I see something, I definitely know I saw it, but I lean to the military answer than like, the alien answer. I would go that way because it's, apart from anything else, it's the most credible way to look at it. If you rule everything else out, every other possible explanation, then 
what you're left with is the fantastic, yeah? Yeah. So I've, I've never seen anything like that. The, the two things I've seen that were, that would prompt UFO reports on, well, I saw a meteorite crash, which is mm. quite unusual, when I was a kid. And it actually came down in Northern Ireland, but I was living in West Cumbria at the time. And it came right over our house. So it, it basically flew, well, it flew across the Lake District, across our house, crossed the North Sea and crashed in Northern Ireland. So it's, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's got a Wikipedia page <laughs> explaining it all. Although there are still, there were, there were UFO reports to do with that. And then the only, the other thing that I saw, which was quite mysterious, I would put down to military activity, which is that um, literally looking up at the stars one night, suddenly one star that was absolutely static shot off from a standing star, clearly from a standing star. Um, so it didn't shoot across the sky. It was amongst others, and I'm not expert enough to know exactly yeah. which constellation it was in, and it all happened very quickly. But it definitely started, as I saw it, from a standing star, and just shot off to the edge of the horizon and disappeared. So um, that, that, that would freak me out, <laughs> that, that sort of thing. Well, yeah, unless it's... Unless it's a satellite that's still got fuel that's changing position, right? And if oh, it were right, a yeah. spying satellite or something like that, that's exactly what that speed? What well, because it's not in the atmosphere at that point, it's way above it, so it, it mm. wouldn't have much friction. It would, it would gather speed very quickly, yeah. because if you, um, you don't need much fuel if there's a very light weight of satellite yeah. and it's got some fuel on board. You, the acceleration would be Easy, very, very yeah, fast. Yeah. And uh, so... To my mind, that would be what I was looking mm. at. I mean, it, yeah. it, you know, it, I don't recall that particular event prompting massive amounts of UFO no. reports or whatever. I mean, you just got me thinking. Um, me and my wife, we were driving from Stanford to Cornwall, and we went past Stonehenge. Mm. And there's this great big beam of light coming out of the centre of Stonehenge. And we thought at the time, it looked really, really creepy. We thought, press press what they do at Stonehenge. And on the way back, we actually, a uh, week later after the eclipse, we went in and visited Stonehenge and we said to them, now we sit on the way down with this light coming out of it. And we're like, I ain't got no lights. <laughs> and yeah. that, that floored us because we definitely see this beam of light. And I'm thinking, okay, did we watch some, was something being made there? Was a TV show being made there? Yeah, quite possibly. So you have to rule out all those sort of things. And, and that's like with the paranormal. You've got to work out what is normal before you know what is beyond normal. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the same sort of thing that you come down to. Well, that, 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 that's one thing that's kept me going over the years in, in all the paranormal stuff, but I mean, it, it's mainly been in UFOs that, that I've been interested. The, that, that's a really good way of putting it, what you just said about ruling out what's, what's normal. Because I would say our understanding of normal in the decades that I've been interested has changed significantly. Mm. So, um, what when I was first interested, it was that some of these cases were incredible and if, if only one of them were true there would be no doubt yeah. i mean it, so it, it before my time but it, if you go back and look at the books of george adamski where the world and his dog would now probably agree that those photographs are hoax you will find people yeah. who <laughs> right but i remember my dad saying to me because my dad owned a copy of flying sources have landed um and i read it when i was about 11 or 12 and i remember him saying to me just pointing the, to one of the photographs and saying well if that was true, there's no doubt. I mean, if you could authenticate that photograph, mm. then you're sorted, aren't you? That, that there's no doubt that these things are real. But those spectacular cases have kept coming. But our understanding of things like fantasy-prone personality disorder or whatever has, has expanded a lot. And, you know, we're saying about electrical effects on people's brains. And that science stands up mm. and it goes forward. So, you know, an interesting question. Which leading ufologist being interviewed by The Guardian about a book said that ufology needed rescuing from its own supporters? Tim Good, right? I.e. the guy that sold a million copies of <laughs> one book. Okay. Yeah, and even he says that, right? Now that's interesting because, and he said that in, I think that's from beyond, when he was promoting Beyond Top Secret. Yeah. It was interesting that The Guardian yeah. actually bothered to interview him in the first place. Um, and even he said that, that this is a subject that needs rescuing from its own supporters. And effectively, I, I guess, uh, yeah, okay, I understand that. Yeah, and, uh, effectively what he was saying was, and okay, this is too, he's, he's talking to the Guardian at this point, he would be very sceptical anyway, but effectively what he's saying is, um, 
the people who believe it the most are probably taking it into the area of the least credibility. In the and, fiction. Yeah, and he's not, he's not spelling it out, but effectively, if you think some of these people might actually be unaware that they are fantasy prone, yeah. there are other people who, what they call status inconsistency, and again, there's sociological research on this where you've got people who are highly intelligent but not necessarily getting all they think that they should be getting out of life, and if they can stumble on this big secret that suddenly undermines everybody else who seems to be doing better, <laughs> yeah, then they've yeah. got one over, haven't they? Yeah. I mean, in just the same way that a bunch of stoners sitting around listening to music and be going, yeah, well, I don't really want a well-paid job <laughs> or anything like that, right? And, you know, so it's you, you, you've got that kind of group thing. And I think collectively, Timothy Good was, that's what it, I understood him to be saying anyway. And he, he's, he's right, because the advances that we've made have often been at the expense of what people believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and but then again, what about people that can have all the evidence in front of them and yet still believe something? Flat Earth. What about them? Right, they they will believe everything. I've not had dealings with the flat. You're going to have to inform me about this. I mean, I know who they are. Yeah, and I, I know that recently flat Earthers have become less uh, rarefied. The, the, the Flat Earth Society if I recall it, actually closed some few decades ago, but now flat earthers, it's like creationists, thing. have become more popular um, again. Yeah? Alfie Days has just done a, a podcast with right. a flat earther who has basically given up his job, everything, and he lives to try and prove that flat earth is, is the thing really? that we live on. Alfie uh, David. Alfie Days. Alfie Days. Uh, pointless blog. He's, he's a, a YouTuber. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, do you know what? I've heard about this guy and I've not actually... And I've he's, not he's investigated. He's doing these podcasts. I mean, he literally is a daily blogger, but, you no, know, my my daughter's addicted to, like, Joe Sugg, who's on Strictly at the moment, and, and Zoella. But I like Alfie because of his opinions and his business brain. Um, but he's just done this one. Out of coincidence, we'd already planned to do this. And then he'd done this one on the Flat Earth, Flat right. Earthers. Um, but I put up a post on my Stanford page today. Mm. Do we have any? Does anyone believe in a flat Earth? And I think it's got about nine or ten. Yes, they do. All the rest believe in like um, it's on the back of a turtle. But <laughs> through yeah. the old uh, disc world novels, too, <laughs> Pratchett. Yeah. Um, but you know, we're on a round ball. But even in that small community, we've got people that truly believe. Uh, do you know? You, 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 you've got one on me there because I wouldn't begin to know. So. How do you know whether they're saying yes just to be ironic? Um, well, there's a pinch of salt, isn't it? it because is. normally there's enough now. There's enough comical answers on there that they they slip that. But I do know there's a few people in my area that truly do believe mm -hmm. that we live on a, a, a flat disc. I, I'm I'm willing to bet that there are people who do, and I mean I'm old enough that I've seen one or two things which were clearly fiction, become factual beliefs. So the... Trump, Trump becoming Prime Minister, have been the president, well, yeah. the Simpsons. Yeah, yeah. but they, they, when they did that, they did not for one second believe it was going <laughs> to happen, did they? No. You know, you've got to be careful for what you wish. I, I was thinking of alternative three, actually, which is the... was blatantly... Uh, an, it was a TV documentary that was broadcast in 1977, and it was about the, basically the, the, the story was that the entire Apollo space program and everything that preceded it was misleading the public and it was a hoax because actually there was a separate program going on because they realized that the greenhouse effect was going to destroy humans on Earth so we had to populate somewhere else. And it ended with a man landing on Mars and the discovery of life, yeah? Mm. And I've met people who believe it's true. And it, it wasn't, and in fact, if you, if you find the original broadcast, um, it was broadcast, I think, in June 1977. But one significant thing is that in the end of the credits, they date it to April the 1st, right? Um, <laughs> and I, I was watching it knowing it was rubbish because, you know, like I say, I was, I was into the Apollo moonshot and everything. So they, I think there's an astronaut called Charles Grodin or Bob Grodin or something mm. turns up into it. Um, and I just know he wasn't a real astronaut, yeah? I'm being asked how long that I'm, I'm, this, is, this is the guy from Stanford who can't handle the walk home. If we had an estimated time left, Shane, how long? Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes, Graham. 
<laughs> I'm no, allowed to come back and do another one. No, no, it, it's, it's Jane's yoga night. I'm all right. It's a, 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 <laughs> she's not home till about quarter past seven. So Is, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, going on to that. So, Van Halen belt. I believe we landed on the, the Van Halen belt. Right. The Van Allen belt. Van Allen belt. <laughs> Van Halen, yeah, yeah, it would be great, wouldn't it? Was it Van Halen? Were the band? Was if, the band. If, if we're talking about um, misperceptions and beliefs, yeah, Van Halen were the band who had a rider that wanted all the brown M and M's taken out. Yes, right. Okay. Most people believe that story shows them as a bunch of up themselves rock stars. Yeah. Are you aware it was actually that rider really did exist? And are you aware about how intelligent that was? No. <laughs> it's an interesting story. Um, I only read it recently. Twenty minutes. Right. <laughs> Van Halen were, and I'm not a huge fan, although I think Jump is a masterpiece, but um, Van Halen were pushing pyrotechnics on stage in the 1980s, mm. above and beyond where other people were. So they didn't have the biggest laser light show or anything, but their ability to ignite fireworks on stage was at a level that previously hadn't really been attempted. So they're actually quite intelligent guys. And one of the things that they were aware of is that they were perfectly capable in the wrong circumstances of burning down an auditorium and taking <laughs> themselves with it, right? So the whole thing about the brown M&M story was that if they turned up and they found a bunch of brown M&Ms in a bowl in their dressing room, right? They thought these people haven't read the rider and if they can't sort the M&Ms, they probably can't sort the voltage on the stage. And if they get that wrong, we're all dead, right? potentially. Um, so the whole point of the story was that they really did that, but what they were checking was how diligent the, the venues were, because if they yeah. were dealing with people who weren't going to pay attention... That's really clever. Yeah, it is, actually. And it, it's, it's kind of relevant in the sense that there are myths that go around. I, I read that recently, and I'd completely fallen for the fact that this was just, you know, this was like sex and cocaine, and, yeah. you know, it was like... Yeah. We'll do whatever we can because we're Van Halen. But actually, there's a hell of a lot of intelligence behind that. Yeah, it's really something about it. It's just, um, because when you talk about music, you've got a real depth knowledge of music as well. Um, a bit, yeah. <laughs> I can't well, so much so number one this week, though. You made us listen to Napalm Death. <laughs> oh, right, okay. No apologies. <laughs> the world and his dog should listen to Napalm Death, <laughs> right? And if your thing is on YouTube, everybody should go and have a look at the official y y You Suffer video all 2.4 seconds of it and absolutely I've marketing. played it to every class I've ever taught really yeah good well because of you <laughs> all my clients have ever been in my classes have really? all heard no palm desk road really? record shortest record song yeah it, you suffer I mean there are shorter songs now there are, there are songs yeah, these yeah. days they're so short I mean, it's that, just one call isn't it? it's just boom yeah, yeah. yeah. and the, the lyrics are like Ugh! but, but yeah. that this is no palm death and I remember the day you, you showed us it and I was like what the hell? Yeah. And then you followed it up by making a study count how many times a set of legs was shown in the video by ZZ Top legs. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, as in that. The point of that wasn't to just admire people. Just like, making us all sit there looking. No, no, it was critical thinking. It was basically if you look at if you look at the those seminal v ZZ Top videos. It was a, if if you use content analysis, if you literally count things you can come up with a very simple argument to say these are a bunch of middle-aged middle sexist pigs exploiting women yeah. to sell records, right? If you look at the iconography, then you get a completely different story because they're that's mythical. That's the one that you were teaching us. Yeah. <sighs> that's but, and, and, but, Do you know, but, I can't remember that word for years. Iconography, yeah, but it, it, well, it, it, the, there is a mythical structure in those videos which involves the passing of power with the throwing of a key ring. Yeah. I mean, to, to this day, that's a model that works for, you know, pop videos, yeah? yeah. And <laughs> the, the entire point of that was that if you take all the videos from the Eliminator album, you can pretty much say they mean one thing, but you can count them <laughs> to say that they mean another. Yeah. And it's, the, your, your argument depends entirely on how you line your evidence up, because you can't prove it either way, but you can prove that yeah. ZZ Top's... One thing, one great thing about ZZ Top, they, this is a personal opinion, I mean, obviously you can't <laughs> prove this, but I would say that any band whose biggest selling album is not their greatest hits have probably got some musical credibility, because at least mm. once they contained a vision, and Eliminator is still bigger selling than ZZ Top's greatest hits. Mm. I mean, which puts them into a, um, 
it puts them in fairly elite company because other bands that would qualify would be yeah. the Beatles, Pink Floyd. Yeah. I mean, that big, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, so it's it's the ones who've made massive artistic statements. And no, actually, the Eagles, that's the greatest hits, isn't it? But Michael Jackson's Thriller, for example, is bigger selling than any compilation that he's yeah. party to. So it, ZZ Top are in that rarefied company. And Eliminator is that album. And those videos that you were studying are the ones... It was that, fun enjoyable. Yeah. I mean, it's good music. It was good music. Mm, I saw them last year, actually. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, they, they're... I love their music, and I, if you're into ZZ Top, it depends on Rhythmine, 1996? Yes. Right, okay. I love that, and I had it as a big album on my show not long ago, because it's their commercial suicide album, and I love them <laughs> for taking a big record contract and doing an album that they must have known was going to cost them hit singles and probably record sales. I guess they're so rich they don't really need to worry about it anymore. And certainly when I saw them... But it was just like coming over as fun. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> but they're really smart. Yeah. They don't, don't take them as idiots. They are really smart. Mm. They're, the business brain behind them is incredible. And for years, they were a four-piece band on their contract. Nearest makes no odds. The fourth guy being the manager, right? So they were dividing a lot of the money four ways for which they were getting pretty much his undivided attention. And the genius that put the attention to detail in those videos was the making of them on yeah. a worldwide scale. Yeah. Ran over, okay? Ran right. And but the, from the slip of the tongue, him, yeah? from yeah. Van Halen to Van Halen. <laughs> yeah, on the Van Halen belt, yeah, yeah. How do you explain that? You know, this is the biggest argument that we did not go to the moon, that we, we can't get past that, because at the time, the, the radiation would have fried anything on there, all cameras, all computers. Simply, given that somebody's asking me to give them a write up in a minute, I would say that I don't, I'm, first of all, I'm not a scientist. Secondly, I trust peer review, which is the means by which scientific knowledge becomes accepted yeah. facts. So basically, university researchers and other people at that level of expertise publish papers in peer-reviewed journals where they can only get accepted because their colleagues think that the arguments are acceptable, mm. even if they don't want to hear them and don't necessarily like them, right? Yeah. Consequently, there is no hard peer-reviewed science that says the Van Allen belt is going to kill us all. And the evidence is surviving astronauts, amongst other things, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Buzz Aldrin probably went to the moon. And as we're sitting here today, despite the fact that he was on the first manned mission to the moon, the guy's still breathing. Yeah. Right? And not only that, but if he'd be, if he's... But I could be able to say that's why he didn't go to the moon. Well, he's still breathing. <laughs> it could be. I wouldn't use that as a point. To no, I, I wouldn't. But, but, but if, even if the Van Allen belt was so destructive that it was going to seriously compromise his health, he wouldn't still be breathing because his post-moon problems included a problem with alcohol for a very lengthy yeah. period, which would have given his immune system quite a kick in. Yeah? yeah. So if he'd been irradiated to the point where his immune system was permanently compromised, he would probably be dead by now. Mm. It, and Neil Armstrong would have outlived him. By but also, time. so okay, we went for back the evidence of UFOs. Astronauts uh, recall or report UFO stuff. I mean, there's that one where you've got the red object floating around. Mm -hmm. That that puzzles me. That's um, yeah, I can't remember and, who reported that one. Yeah, and and, and we we, we can't look. There's a few of those. Well, and, well, the truth is, we can't know about a lot of these things. I mean, there's look. There's the books that claim that the moon's an artificially constructed spaceship include verbatim transcripts of transmissions between Apollo astronauts and mission control that both sides of that argument say never, both sides of, who were quoted in that say never happened, right? Yeah. But other people say, yeah, but they would deny that, wouldn't they? Yeah, all right? Yeah, the conspiracy, um, most of the UFOs that are filmed in space have been debunked as understandable objects that would be around capsules and some of them are provably so you know so that the the things that are you know that they're bits and pieces of water or whatever that's been jettisoned or there's their ice off the side of a spacecraft there are one or two that are harder to explain than that off the top of my head i couldn't quote your chapter and verse about exactly when and where but my best guess would be that because most of the explanations that are provable have stood up quite well, yeah. you might trust the people who came up with those arguments to explain away the rest of it. Yeah, Because when I've got with scientists and people like that who know a hell of a lot more about that side of it than I do, 
and they do it's garbage to think these people aren't interested it's garbage to think they don't come to conferences and talk to people and I've met on the on the occasions when I was doing talks at things like the unconvention the 14 times unconvention the people who would come up and talk to me afterwards would include quite serious academic people yeah I got a gig in um, University of Winchester I did a put a 14 times unconvention and talked about conspiracy theories and stuff and whatever and uh, a guy called Dr. Alistair Spark, I think it was, asked me to come to the opening of a centre of the for the study of conspiracy culture, which was an academic conference. And uh, these are a bunch of people who publish and research academic papers, um, and they were interested. There's no absolutely no question <laughs> that they were interested, and they didn't want to turn up and debunk it. They were interested because they thought there was stuff to learn. And whilst their interest was conspiracy culture, hmm. they, like me, would love to have seen the one thing that was not what people believed but was actually provably true yeah right so i, th I think it's uh, the wow signal was became the wow signal because somebody from a scientific background was amazed at what they discovered mm. it wasn't the like oh let's hush it up signal yeah it was the wow signal yeah, yeah. so um I don't know, this whole thing about narrow-minded so scientists. do you think that if there's something out there yeah that when we all know it's there, it's not hushed up. If it happens, we will all know about it. Unavoidably, be no... because first of all, um, oh, what's the guy's name? Edward Arnold, who was a scientist who wrote a book about UFOs, makes a very clear point about if you've got one sniff of alien air, your chance of hanging onto your bowels and the rest of your constitution <laughs> is virtually nil, you know? Um, so, therefore, any significant, if, if, if a spaceship landed, the first thing we've got to worry about is what microbes are on that thing. We yeah. can't assume that they all yeah. were destroyed in the atmosphere, right? Um, well, that's the thing about the one in Bristol. The, the report was that the alien got out of the ship and suffocated. So that was the report in the Bristol. Oh, in the, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, but OK, but then the, the, the alien that was manning the ship that uh, collided with the judge's windmill in Aurora is buried in the cemetery, right? <laughs> Get out of here, seriously. I think this... <laughs> The airship craze from the 1890s, provably a lot of that is to do with America linking itself up with the telegraph and telegraph operators swapping stories that were what absolutely about garbage. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, the, the, well, but the Bristol one is the same thing. It's, 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 look, I'm not the greatest authority on that, but as I understand it, there are a number of wide, there are angels and devils and stuff like that mm. that were seen by large numbers of people. But, but then again, you look at deformities in the children of born. Yeah. Yeah. And if you see someone walking around that's got two arms or some these twins or something, you don't understand that, you are going to think they're an alien or misformed heads and, and all that. that you yeah. Or you could use a certain amount of critical thinking and say, well, if, could, because people are going to think that, there, there's loads of examples that you can see where stories become widely believed and you, you've got to use some critical thinking to say, well, what would have prompted it? In Laurie Lee's Cider with Rosie, which is one of the greatest autobiographical books ever written in the 20th century, right? It was studied for years in schools. There's a story about a two-headed sheep mm. that all the kids, this is, he's a little kid at this point, and he's talking about the days after the First World War. There's a two-headed sheep that people saw, and it could speak in dual voices and, you know, was visible, and if you saw it during a thunderstorm, it, you know, and it, amongst other things, it would foretell the moment of your own death. Now, in reality, there are two headed sheep, there, there are birth defects. Yeah. In a rural area, people would see two headed sheep. Kids are scared of thunder, you, you know, and it, it becomes a folktale, mm. yeah, and, and two or three people stitch that together to the point where people believe it which would have been, so he's reporting an accurate belief and when he writes it, it's wonderful writing because he says there's nothing remarkable about it, i.e. he almost talks in the voice of a child and says, well, we all know this is true, you know, and, and that's what's genius about it because at the point he's writing, he's a middle-aged man, but he sounds like a kid. And a lot of these things become believed, but you can, if you, a couple of things on that, if you attach some critical thinking, you can say, well, where did this start and how do people believe it? And with regard to what we're seeing at the moment, the kind of modern myths of UFOs and everything, often a lot of these people see things, even hard-headed people who are 
apparently capable of understanding what they see as they see it, sometimes see things and actually they're mis misperceiving it from the start. Yeah, the, 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 the Kakura UFOs, the brief worldwide story in the late 1970s where apparently in New Zealand they'd filmed alien spacecraft, some of it provably when you actually look at the radar traces and stuff like that, they're seeing. There are people in the air seeing a squid boat and thinking that they're filming a UFO, right? <laughs> and even potentially, there's a giveaway because the plane on which they're filming makes a turn, and um, at the at this point, the implication is the pilot realizes that he's been an idiot. But yeah. on the other hand, he's got a film crew on board who are filming yeah. it, so he quietly turns it back again. Um, but you know, provably so, and. There's a TV reporter reporting in the moment while another guy films, and they're absolutely convinced they're seeing alien <laughs> spacecraft, you know. And then at the point, if they get away from that and they think, oh, maybe we didn't, they've still just filed the most lucrative report of their careers, and they're by media standards, you know, Australia and New Zealand in the late 70s is the provinces, isn't it? Yeah. And the fact that they've got American TV stations ringing them up, demanding the film and paying money for it. They're not, of course they're Massive not, you know. Hit. <laughs> yeah. But but it's the same thing as the, you know, the two headed sheep or whatever, that you could you could say, well, okay, there are quite a lot of people who could judge it critically. In that moment they believe they're seeing something and then that becomes infectious. Mm. Yeah. Final couple of questions. Go on. Do you believe that aliens have visited us and are or are here now living? At this moment, no. I'd love to be wrong. So you, you don't think they've ever visited? No, and if they did, it's not the question you're asking me. If alien life visited this planet, it arrived on asteroids and stuff like that. And that's and what, it, where we come from? Yeah, yeah. and it, it contributed to the stuff. It, it brought the chemicals. It didn't yeah. actually, it wasn't life. It brought the chemicals that brought about our that's, existence. That's, that's, that's all it echoes my sort of um, theory on it. Yeah. Um, so actually, it's not life. It's the means of life. Okay, so yeah. the other one is, what would you be more shocked at? The, the clans parting and God waving down saying, hello, I'm Will. Or a spaceship coming down in the middle of Wembley during a football match and aliens getting out? What would be more shocking for you? That's a really good question. I mean, th we're talking metaphorically, yeah, yeah. right? So would I be more shocked that God reveals himself or the aliens landed? That's a hell of a question. I would be hugely shocked by both of them. And the, the honest to God answer, I won't lie here, is I don't know. Mm. It, would, it would depend on it. Um, I'm, by virtue of being an agnostic, I'm the most religious person in my family. Yeah. <laughs> Me and three atheists. I just think it's intellectually dishonest to, to deny the existence of God because there may be intelligence in everything we're seeing. So the entire thing might be a, a pattern that's so Even self -evident. Stephen Hawking's, he tells us, you know, doing what he does, he always likes to be proven wrong. So in his last book, he said, is there a God? And he says, no. But in science, you always end up being proven wrong. Yeah. And yeah, and, and I'm, I'm completely with that. I would probably be less shocked at the aliens because if, uh, yeah, thinking about it, that would be marginally less shocking because the argument for how and why that might happen yeah. is actually supported by more scientists yeah. than most ufologists would like to believe. Scientists in other galaxies. Out there. Yeah, and, and, and so the implication would be if there are ways of traveling through wormholes that we think are plausible but somebody else has mastered, yeah. it's entirely possible that they simply turn up. And if they did, you know, not maybe the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy would be more true than you think, as in they mm. simply turn up and say, look, man, you're in the way. We're going to demolish you to make yeah. a bypass, you know. I uh, knew uh, we'll go to stop there because right. <laughs> yeah. Graham's desperate to go home. Okay. Yeah. And um, we might have to do another on conspiracy theories at another point. Yeah. More so than welcome, Shane. Thank yeah. you uh, for letting me come over and film you. And no, you're welcome. It's great meeting back up with you after 30 odd years. It's a bit surreal, Shane, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah. It's yeah. Definitely very Somebody definitely. that you've taught will do the same to you one day. Yeah, hopefully. Well, hopefully. why not? That'd be great. Wouldn't that be a good event? It'd be yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Neil, thank you so much. Right, yeah, cheers.